Okay. Um, well, welcome everyone to the first 2024 um, lecture of the New York Society of the American Institute of Archaeology. I'm Timothy Pugh, and um, tonight I'm going to fill in for the, the chapter's president, Antonius Kutsanas, and I'm a board member of the New York Society, specializing in Mesoamerica, and a professor at the City University of New York, actually one of um, six archaeologists there. And the the uh, New York Society of the AIA was established in 1884, um, just a few years after the National Society, and it's one of the largest in the country. Um, the primary goal of the society is education in the form of archaeological research and bringing archaeology to the public. And um, each year, the society supports several lectures and provides fellowships and funding for field work for young scholars at, at universities in New York City through its scholars program. The society includes both professional archaeologists and amateurs. If you're not a member and you're drawn to the past or simply enjoy going to museums, you should really consider joining. If there's no chapter in your area, um, please consider joining the New York Society as our lectures are currently on Zoom. Uh, membership also includes a subscription to one of AIA's publications, such as Archaeology Magazine, which is always a fun, you know, if you don't, if you, if you don't read it, the, the pictures are great. Um, so please consider joining if you're not already a member. Okay, tonight um, we will enjoy a lecture by Dr. Joel Palka, an associate professor at the School of Human Evolution and Social Change of Arizona State University. And I asked Joel if there was anything that I should mention in my introduction. And he reminded me that we met each other 30 years ago in Patan, Guatemala, uh, when he was um, finishing up his dissertation at Vanderbilt University. And with that, I adjusted the 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 ager on my my Zoom a little bit there, <laughs> because that, when you really think 30 years, I mean, that, <clears throat> wow. Um, at that time, his research was focused on cultural collapse at the site of Dos Pilas. And um, Joel does a lot of things, which, you know, you're going to see a lot of that. He does, he's not only is he a dirt archaeologist like I am, he's, he also does uh, Maya glyphs and um, ethno archaeology, which you'll hear about tonight. Um, Okay, more recently, Joel has, has moved his research to Chiapas, Mexico. He works in collaboration with the Lacandon Maya, the Hatswinik, who occupy the area. Joel's work has added to our, oops, to our knowledge of the Lacandon's history in Chiapas. The resilience and remoteness of the Lacandon allowed them to avoid conquest by the Spaniards. His most recent work, which he'll discuss today, um, involves the human environment interaction in Chiapas. However, his, his work is not old school materialism. He takes a more nuanced view to uh, the Maya landscape, combining both the mental and material um, aspects uh, in amalgamation of the natural landscape, the social landscape, and the sacred landscape. Hopefully I'm getting all this right, Joel. Um, Joel has been supported by a number of granting agencies, including multiple grants from the National Science Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the National Geographic Society, among others. He has publications on a variety of topics and numerous, with in numerous articles and several books. And tonight he's going to discuss ecological aquaculture and domesticated waterscapes in ancestral Maya society, subsistence and art in Chiapas, Mexico, comparative perspectives. So everyone, please uh, welcome Joel Palka and make sure that your your um, Zoom is on mute. So you, you can take over, Joel. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Well, it's uh, you know, it's a real privilege and an honor to be here. I was really happy when when you and 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 invited me to speak today in in New York because uh, yeah, like I like I mentioned that email. We've known each other for for thirty years, and most of the time we met up in Peten or at or at the archaeology meetings or something like that. But I gave a a talk too to the. Uh, AIA chapter in uh, Phoenix, Arizona it was a real, it's a real good experience because of this comparative perspective that that I'm going to be talking about today and the importance of of uh, kind of wetland modification features or domesticated landscapes, uh, which I tend to call it. Uh, you'll find around the world, I mean, even if people here are interested in. Uh, uh, Egyptian archaeology or uh, archaeology around the 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 Tigris Euphrates rivers. If you go to Mesopotamia, you'll see wetland uh, modifications for uh, what I call ecological aquaculture as well. So, so yeah, this is a you know it's real. I, I jumped at this chance to to talk to this group uh, uh, for those reasons, and and also like you mentioned, Archaeology Magazine. I, I think it's the uh, it's kind of the longest running uh, journal 
subscription that I have. I've been getting it for probably 30, 35 years because it's it's just the best way to keep up on, on what's happening around the world. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and speak then and, and give this presentation and I'll kind of watch the speaker's windows here to make sure that I don't lose my internet uh, connection and just keep talking to the screen and not talking to you all. So, so let me go ahead and start then. Should be me, yep. Make sure, yep, this is me. So we're all set and I um, think that the sound is okay and the visuals are okay, Tim, are both all right, mm -hmm. sound and, and you can see my presentation. And, well, good. Well, I've called, I call this uh, kind of ecological aquaculture and domesticated waterscapes because this, this is a reaction to people in archaeology that talk about uh, you know, irrigation, agriculture, and, and raised fields. And they leave out the other half of the kind of the dietary uh, uh, spectrum here when you have all that water. Uh, and 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 you and people don't focus on or think about the aquatic resources or resources from the actual waterworks that are used in in uh, irrigation agriculture. Now, in my talk today, I'll be focusing on domesticated waterscapes and aquatic resources. Uh, it doesn't mean that agriculture is not important, and I want to say this up front: agriculture is extremely important but it's just part of the subsistence picture. It's just part of the dietary picture. And, and uh, years ago, I was talking to a colleague at the Field Museum. We, we worked on an article together called, uh, it was on domesticated landscapes. And, and John Terrell, the, the lead author, was talking about a, a, in, in the article and in our interesting conversations about a subsistence spreadsheet, that it's not just uh, like cultivated plants, but people are eating whatever they can get their hands on at any any given time. So that's how I'm looking at at, at ancient Maya uh, subsistence. I'm looking at more of like integrated subsistence. And so anyway, I'll be talking about all this today, but I just wanted to let people know that I'm not saying that that everybody was just fishing and, and agriculture is just kind of an aside, but, but uh, it's kind of the other way around. Agriculture was so important, but people were also fishing. Uh, as well. And so I look at ancestral Maya society. I call it that because it's not just ancient Maya society. I work with a contemporary Lacandon Maya society. I live in their village and we collaborate on research. And, um, and, and so it's, it's some of these behaviors, subsistence behaviors, and the importance of aquatic resources continues today. So it's something more of as ancestral and not ancient Maya. And then my, and I'm also looking at it through, as like Tim said in the introduction, I, I get evidence from wherever I can, uh, not just archeology, span but I also look at iconography, hieroglyphic writing and ethnography, uh, working with contemporary communities. And, and so um, now that I have the, uh, that said, the comparative perspectives then is that then I'm actually at the end of the talk, I'm, I'll, I'll also bring up some uh, examples from uh, ancient Egypt, Assyria, Angkor Wat, et cetera, that because that, I know people in, in this in this Zoom room are interested in other parts of the world. So anyway, that's what I'll be uh, up to today. Now, uh, this Kind of my perspectives on domesticated waterscapes and integrated subsistence, or not just agriculture, but aquatic resources. When one day Lock and Don Maya went walking by us with window screen, carrying window screen, which you see here in this slide, buckets and boards. And we asked them, Where are you going? What are you doing? And they said, We're going fishing. And it was interesting because they went into the canals um, and the ponds around. Mensa Bach Chap, that's where I do research. And they merely wade in the water, especially when the water levels go down in the dry season, uh, and they capture fish uh, galore with uh, different kinds of, of, of means. 
And so that's how the idea just kind of popped in my head. It's like, wow, all those canals, all those ponds around Mensabak, uh, like we see here, must be then um, something related to the domesticated waterscape for uh, for um, uh, irrigation and aquaculture features. So you can see here is the village of Mensabak. You can probably see my white arrow moving around here down in the lower part of the screen. This is the contemporary Maya village. And right next to them, you see uh, along this small river here, we have a series of canals leading to, uh, uh, leading to different ponds. And, um, and with these canals then is where the lock and dome would go in and, um, and then capture these, these fish. But these features are clearly seen uh, in this slide. Is everything okay so far on the visuals? There's, I have a couple of me messages in that popping up. I think, I don't think that you could probably see them, but, um, but we should be fine. Let me see if I can cancel that one. Okay. So, um, it, it's clear then, as you can see with my arrow, we have some squarish kind of rectangular fish tanks here with, with canals leading to them and some rounder ones. And I, the, my favorite here is the heart shaped one here, uh, just, uh, uh, west of the village. Anyway, so uh, this is related to then what uh, colleagues have previously called wetland farming. As I mentioned, irrigation, agriculture, or agriculture in raised fields, where throughout the Maya area and in central Mexico, uh, in uh, it, with Aztec civilization, you see extensive uh, uh, wetland farms or raised fields or canals and that people have focused on in research and even in some of their kind of reconstructions uh like you see here of a of a canal and raised field chinapa system in central mexico you'll see ducks hanging out here in this uh in this kind of museum reconstruction and even people fishing so even in reconstructions when people look at raised fields and chinapas they look at the integrated subsistence aspect of it but there's there isn't a lot of of research on uh, the wetland uh, uh, production zone or uh, the wetland uh, aqua, um, aquatic resources and everybody just sticks with, with agriculture. And, and even some of the reconstructions here uh, over on the right part of the slide where we can see that colleagues have put canals in and ponds and plants and fields around, but they always leave this pond area or the cross section of the canal, they'll leave this as, as just for water, movement of water. And we'll see at the end of my talk, when fish biologists or biologists in general look at the system uh, of plants and canals, they, they look at the importance of fish and aquatic resources that, that is so important for the system, right? Like when people take sediment out of these canals or even water, uh, these canals and put it on nearby plants, you're placing a lot of nitrogen uh, in, 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 in this, these agricultural systems. So uh, the actual fish, the presence of fish is so important uh, in these canals for, for agriculture. And of course the plants, of course you need to give food to the fish. It's largely plants provide invertebrates. Uh, so aquatic invertebrate, invertebrates or terrestrial invertebrates that are in the water that provide the food for the fish and the turtles and, and the like. And I'll talk about some more interesting things there with the relationship between canals and, and irrigation and, and agriculture late at the end of the talk. So the, the big question is, is then uh, are fish important or were fish important to ancient civilizations? Uh, were aquatic resources, including fish, and, and like this poor guy here being served up worms on a hook by his fish wife, <laughs> uh, and turtles and ducks, et cetera, et cetera, were these kinds of resources important for past civilizations and how important were they? And so even today, I'm in, I'm in Mexico now and just wandering through the market uh, I don't just see signs of, of agriculture. Uh, and many of you have gone to markets where you live and gone to markets around the world on your travels, and you'll certainly see a lot of aquatic resources that are available for people for their, 
their kind of daily fare, and especially some of my favorite, like these fish tacos with slices of lime in Mexico. Uh, uh, it's, it's really essential, isn't it? So we know we can just look around and see that 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 fish and other aquatic resources were very, very important. Now we can also see the evidence is right in front of us from the ethnohistoric record in, in Mesoamerica or ancient Mexico and Central America, where I and, and Tim here do, do research. A lot of the documents uh, that were created by uh, indigenous people in the early colonial period show the importance of, uh, of fishing. And what I just want to point out on a few of these slides here is we, is we get different even perspectives of the different aquatic features like ponds, fish ponds. Uh, we have canals. Uh, and canals and these fish ponds are good because they're often shallow, like I showed in my early slide with the Lacandona Maya. Uh, it's shallow where the water is up to uh, maybe up to your uh, knees or waist or shoulders. It doesn't matter as long as you can walk around and move around in it. You can take different implements from nets and snares uh, or even we'll see with your hands to go and you can extract uh, resources from these shallow features that you'll see across the world. Now, another thing is really important too, I wanna to point out is sometimes the modifications are not, uh, they're not kind of uh, archeologically uh, visible or uh, you might not even recognize them. Like we see here in this codex here on the right, uh, we have extensive modifications of the waterscape with just stakes, stakes and nets uh, where people have, in, in this case in central Mexico, basically staked off the entire lake system. And I, I even saw this recently in the Maya area, and I'll show a slide later, that they're, they're, I, I was asking local people for canals. Where are all the canals? Where are all the fish ponds? And I go, well, we just modified the whole lake within the lake itself. We don't need to make canals um, because we just stake off the lake and put in uh, and put in nets everywhere. So there's different levels, so to speak, of the visibility of these kinds of wetland features. And some of them archeologically are, are hard to see, but I'll show you some evidence of, that we've actually seen some. Uh, here's some more of these kind of implements and techniques, people waiting in, in these uh, you know, the Mesoamerican iconography. We have a uh, probably uh, somebody in central Mexico, maybe an Aztec person or or, or, or related kind of, uh, of uh, a person from a society in central Mexico wading through a canal and uh, snaring and grasping fish in this uh, uh, in, in in this case. And then we have a Maya car, a drawing from a Maya car bone here on the bottom of the slide. And we see some Maya deities, some rain deities or, uh, that are in a canoe and grabbing fish or they're uh, there's actually another one of these god, rain gods wading in the water up to the god's waist, and, and, and this god is handing what looks like a catfish to these other gods in the canoe, probably throwing the fish right in the canoe. But even this god here is a basket. He's wearing one of these creels or a basket and is putting fish in that. Now, the interesting thing here is if you look at these species that are often shown in in Mesoamerican art and in art in other parts of the world, even are are good species for aquaculture, uh, and like uh, cichlids or mojarras, which you'll see in this uh, basket here in this god's hand, and and catfish, and a lot of these species that that do very well in these kind of managed waterscapes. This is kind of neat, and even ethnographically, uh, well, like I mentioned, working with the Lacandon. Uh, they show me and tell me that fishing and other aquatic resources like turtles and ducks and, and plants, et cetera, are really important for their lives and their diet. But even around in other parts of the Maya area and other parts of, of Mexico with other cultures, you can see these, these so-called ephemeral, uh, what people call ephemeral kind of modifications of the, uh, of the waterscape putting in dams and weirs and that to capture uh, fish and other, and other aquatic uh, resources. So kind of right in front of us, right in front of our faces uh, in iconography and, and in uh, contemporary societies, we can see the importance of, 
of aquatic resources and, and the means to to acquire those. So, so how do we look at this in the past? Well, like I mentioned that uh, people, my colleagues have been looking at these raised fields. And, and again, I would say, again, this is wetland uh, production, not just raised fields and canals, looking at water management, uh, looking at even in this, uh, on the left here, you can see that uh, my colleagues here mapped Ed's Na, and have a, 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 a lot of canal and reservoir uh, uh, systems here. And then mark on the map, this is for intensive agriculture. And, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of not really grappling with this, but I, I kind of shift from like calling this ecological aquaculture, which the biologists call this, like a lot of fish biologists call uh, this aquaculture system on a massive scale. I mean, we're talking here about a system here, it's at least like three kilometers by two kilometers in size. So this is, these are not small aqu uh, cement aquaculture tanks. Uh, this is a huge, huge, massive system. So it's on, in, in, it's on a, a large scale that it actually just kind of mimics the, uh, a, a wetland ecology. Basically what people have done is they've, they've extended the wetland ecology to where they can more easily uh, capture uh, aquatic resources. Uh, I'm also looking at this, I'm seeing, uh, I'm looking in the uh, aquaculture literature a lot more and I'm seeing that some people call this agro um, uh, aquaculture. So I'm kind of shifting that too, but I think just very in general, because I don't like to use a lot of jargon terms. I just think that wetland production is very important because this is an agricultural and an aquacultural combined system. And that's really what I want to focus on in my, in my research. Now I do this at the site of Mensa Bog, which is in the kind of the last the, the gasp of the highlands here, the mountainous regions in, in Chiapas, as you head down to the Tabasco Plain, where all the rivers are running from these highlands down into the plain, you get an incredible amount of, of rivers and uh, floodplain areas or wetland uh, features here uh, where I do my research. And so I'm looking at Mensa Bog and living with the Lacandon Maya there, where that's the slide where I showed you where there's a lot of canals and and fish ponds, but I'm also looking for comparative uh, sites in this area and talking to colleagues and uh, here and even in, in, in central Petén, I wanna look around too, because I've seen some of Tim's earlier publications on fishing at around the, here in the central Petén area. But just looking around, I need comparative sites to show that, uh, that I'm not really kind of out on a limb here with this uh, with this research, but it's actually has a lot of comparative potential as I find in, in other sites and work with colleagues in other parts of this, of this part of the world and maybe even in other parts of the world. So here is uh, Mensa Bach from kind of a bird's eye view here. Uh, and, and at Mensa Bach in, in general, we have uh, a large pre-classic site here that dates to, I would push this back now, uh, I forgot to change it on this slide, but we're probably talking about 800 BC until about AD 200, where we had a very large city uh, just to the south of this, of this lake. And so I'm, I'm looking at Mensa Bach as this, this origin place, this Aztlan-like, uh, Aztec-like origin place of, a, of an island with a water mountain on it. Uh, in the middle of a beautiful lake. And this Atsalan was a place where agriculture came from. And, but if you read the actual sources, it also says that this is where the, the Chinampas uh, and the aquaculture uh, uh, subsistence also started was at this, this kind of this, this mystical origin city. This is also, by the way, an, an area there, there we have uh, historic, uh, just kind of late, pre-contact settlements and historic settlements all around this lake have a large kind of a late post-classic or proto-historic community that dates to about AD 1400 to 1700 uh, here. It's very interesting. We have uh, human remains with sword cuts and machete cuts and that on them. So we have people who are probably fighting the Spanish or fighting Maya allied with the Spanish living on this, this lake. Very, very interesting place to do research plus live with the Lacandon Maya. And it, it just came out. Um, uh, if any of you watched National Geographic or Disney Plus, 
uh, the, the uh, Al Albert Lynn for Lost Cities Revealed uh, just um, uh, they just are now showing this episode Cradle of the Maya on, on television. If any of you would would be interested in checking out this area, that you can see it now on on on, on TV. Anyway, so uh, Mensabak, like I mentioned, is like this origin site. So I actually even like to bring in religion, Mesoamerican religion in, in this study because it's so important because Mesoamerican people do religiously link the origins of, of agriculture with aquaculture. And here is a uh, mural at Titiwakan in central Mexico that shows this origin-like mountain. Uh, and and like the Mensabac Mountain is the origin of the Tuliha River in Chiapas and, and Tabasco. This, this kind of this primordial mountain on the murals of Tetihuacan, there's probably an actual mountain in their area, is the origins of a river. So you see the water streaming out of, the, of a cave on the side of this mountain. And what's interesting is you'll see then the, 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 the river or canals coming from this mountain actually form raised fields. See down here in the bottom right part of the slide, we have these fields, canal and field systems with flowers and other plants that are growing in these raised fields. But then what's often ignored in studies of these murals, we'll see in the canals, we have a lot of fish and turtles, that there's fish and, and other aquatic resources associated with, with these canals. Uh, of course, there's people here living alongside this mountain, or this actually might be a mythical place, but it shows what actual kind of ancient everyday life was with corn growing alongside these canals. And we have a drawing that, again, the fish were left out of this drawing here. Uh, and we, we clearly see these raised fields with, that are associated with plants. And then at the end of the canal, we even have a fish pond that's full of fish. So even kind of ideologically and presented by uh, and, uh, elites at the site of Tetuacan, at the, this palace complex of Tepantitla, uh, you'll see the importance of this integrated subsistence and the importance of aquatic resources shown right here. Uh, it's, and it's kind of even replicated in this busy um, iconography from a beaker on the coast of Peru. Uh, where you will see in coastal Peru, there are not only rivers coming out of mountains, like we see at Tetihuacan, but then canals. Uh, people made these ancestral canals that people are still using today uh, to, yes, to irrigate their crops. But also, if you look at, this is actually a canal, much like we saw at Tetihuacan, there's canal imagery here with water and leads into a fish pond. And we have plants around this canal. Obviously, it's important for agriculture, but within the canal, look at all the fish. There's fish and crabs and different kinds of animals that these people on coastal Peru were also farming. So they're, they're also, also doing this ecological aquaculture, fish farming, at the same time they're, they're farming crops. And this is just kind of this example here of these water mountains in Peru that are the origin places for these rivers and then people are making canals connecting up these, these rivers for not only irrigation agriculture, but ecological aquaculture and aquatic resources. Back to Mensabac, just to show you a kind of a view of all these kinds of fish ponds and canals connecting up to them in all these modified floodplain areas. And again, what the Maya did at Mensabac is they domesticated their waterscape by amplifying the, 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 the kind of the uh, waterways and uh, making these shallow waterways so they could capture more aquatic resources or utilize this water more to their advantage for aquaculture and for agriculture. And one of these sites is right here, the Los Salvadores and this peninsula. Excuse me, there's a lot of canals and fish ponds associated with this site. And we did some excavations here, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, LIDAR, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, images from the big pre-classic city at Mensabac show some of these canals. Up here in the top left, you can see canals and fish ponds in, in this area. And 
And there's there's a city here, this ancient city. It's about over a kilometer long by maybe a quarter to half a kilometer wide, where the Maya filled in this whole area, leveled it off, and then built these large temples and built the city right on this big platform. But what always intrigued me was they they worked on canalizing the water up right into the river and canal and fish pond area. I always thought, why are they draining their gray waters and garbage? Because there's trash in this area too. Why are they draining it here? Of course, I was completely unaware of the aquaculture literature uh, at the time. So again, we have this big city and all the gray waters are draining into the canals and the fish ponds. Uh, it's important to note that there, there's fresh water here. So the, the, the gray water is draining up to the left here, to the west, but to the east, there are cenotes and, and there are um, uh, 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 sources of, of clean water here to the east. So they're draining all their gray waters from there. So it goes to the uh, those to the fish ponds. But I so thought, why are they doing that? But when you actually see an iconography uh, and you look at the aquaculture literature uh, where you have large scale aquaculture systems, they encourage people to put farm animals and put the gray water and put scraps in that water because it energizes the whole system. And this is how you get a lot of invertebrates uh, that feed the fish. And so here again, another scene from the Codex Borgia is we have human excrement. This person is getting poked here in the foot where the lance is uh, excreting right into the water and the fish is eating it. And then there's a raised field here where we're having corn cobs and corn husks being tossed in the water, just like we see some of the garbage in the archeological record at Mensabak is in the water. Uh, we have fish chewing on these corn husks and, uh, and the like. So this gray water and trash helps energize the uh, helps fertilize the entire kind of aquatic system. It was also interesting to see as we did a telephone booth, so-called telephone booth, and some of us here would know what a telephone booth is. <laughs> uh, we did this four meter uh, deep pit. And I remember seeing, visiting the graduate student digging this. And the first thing I saw when I saw this pit was like, what is all this lake sediment doing in here? <laughs> Uh, this is all from those canals and the modifications on the ponds. They're, take, they're scooping up all that wet kind of sediment, which is actually great construction material, and carrying it and plopping it down and, and creating that kilometer long platform. Um, so as they're modifying the waterscape, which I think they did first, of course, they're modifying the waterscape and they're creating the city kind of at the same time or, or after. And I'll talk to them about the importance of modifying waterscapes very early in Mesoamerica in a little bit. Uh, but anyway, so they're kind of hand in hand, modifying and digging out the canals and waterscape and then piling all that settlement sediment in, in creating their city. Uh, so that site of uh, Los Olores, where I mentioned was on that peninsula near some fish ponds. We've done some mapping and and digging, and there's a canal that goes by this site. You can see right here where the arrow is moving, a uh, little canoe port area right here, but we carried out some excavations uh, in this canal feature and uh, around this canal. And this is where we kind of not only studied the, um, the, the wetland uh, modification air, uh, areas here in the domesticated waterscape, but we're kind of looking for archeological evidence of what they're doing here. And so we found a lot of trash being thrown in this canal. And again, that's to fertilize the, uh, the, the aquatic system. But we uh, also find like in excavations here along the canal, we found a lot of broken pots and it looks like they're doing a lot of uh, pot irrigation here, just growing plants when they can, when this is all exposed, uh, when it's not full of water. Uh, we also found evidence of at first we're scratching our heads. Uh, so we found a lot of post holes in the canal. Uh, and we thought, oh, they're just shoring up the sides of the canal. Well, well no, these are probably fish weirs. Uh, and I have some slides in a second showing what these are, stakes for nets or fish weirs. Uh, we have uh, what I thought, I don't know why these are small ceramic beads. They're not spindle whorls. They're not making use for making cotton. They're found in the in the canals. Is this just part of the garbage? Well, these are probably net weights. 
Uh, these are probably ceramic neck weights, uh, which you can actually they can actually be, be very small in this case in a small area in water that's not moving. Uh, and then we have uh, projectile points like the Lock and Dome today and other people in Mesoamerica and other parts of the world actually put different points, metal points or stone points on fish arrows. Uh, and that was actually one of the main ways that Lock and Dome took fish up until about 1980 was through spears and um and and arrows with bow and arrow and fish poisons when you have canals like this you can block off the canals and throw fish poison in the water which is kind of found everywhere in the jungle and you can collect fish that way as well so here's an example of, of kind of how people build these uh, kind of stake weirs or they just stake put stakes in the water and then and then stretch nets in between these stakes and capture uh, fish in these in these contexts. But this is just these these are these sort of kind of the posts that we're finding in the post holes in the canal that at Mensa Bar. And then I went even with Lac Andone, I've I've gone fishing in these areas with them and we stake off parts of the fish ponds. We'll stake them off and then we'll stretch nets in between the stakes and then we'll just canoe around them and hit the water with the paddles and it scares the fish right into the nets. And Within one hour, we got uh, you know, hundreds of pounds of fish. Each person was able to take a whole sack home, uh, fish to feed the family for, for a couple of weeks uh, after smoking this over their, uh, over their, their hearts, uh, uh, feeding their families for, for a long time, uh, just with the, about an hour, hour and a half labor. So it's very, very interesting. And then you know, some of the other features at Mensa Bach that uh, I've already showed about the post holes and the, they're putting up stakes and posts and putting nets, but we'll also see modifications for, um, for like we saw with the ethnographic case uh, with the Kiche Maya that I showed with the ethnographic evidence of making these kind of, of stone channels and stone dams that to block off parts of these canals and rivers so that they can capture fish. So. We're seeing this all over the lakes and, and the canals at Mensabach, extensive aquatic uh, modification. My favorite fishing, fishing and archeology span and a photo is uh, people doing the same thing, staking off areas and extending nets here, right next to the pyramid of Isa near Cairo. Excellent photograph that, that I like showing in, in, in these talks. But I also, that brings up the case of ancient Egypt, too, that one of the comparative cases here, if you look in the art or the archaeology, look at maps or, or uh, look at the different evidence in ancient Egypt. It's not just agriculture. You'll have things like these aquaculture ponds that they reconstruct in the afterlife. Well, they're reconstructing the afterlife what Egyptians are basically living on a daily basis or in the case of elites, at least they're having these fish ponds. Uh, with docks and the like, with gardens and other economically important plants and agricultural plants around them. And again, I like the species being shown because these are cichlids and these are excellent aquaculture species. Uh, they're very hardy, they'll eat anything that doesn't eat them first, et cetera, and they're, they're very tasty. So uh, these are kind of the best fish for, for aquaculture. You can see the other and evidence too from uh, archaeologists looking at the irrigation canals, in ancient Egypt and the pot irrigation again, just like we saw at Mensa Bach, but then the extension of these canals into these fish ponds that held probably a lot of Nile, so-called Nile tilapia or African tilapia or these cichlids, which are excellent aquaculture species. And along with the importance of plants right next to these, next to these uh, aquatic features. Getting in then into Assyria, getting into Mesopotamia, we see similar uh, kind of evidence in the archaeology of dams and canals in uh, in parts of Assyria, of Iraq, where yes, where we have the cradle of civilization and irrigation agriculture, but by the indigenous perspective, this is ecological aquaculture and integrated subsistence. It's not just agriculture. And I was thinking about this too, like even in the Lock and Dome, uh, Lock and Dome language, there's no term for agriculture. There's term for getting resources from the field, terms for getting resources from the water, et cetera, et cetera. 
So even these cradles of civilization, aquaculture is very important. You can see here there's a canal leading into a fish pond and a Syrian probably farmer, fisher person is gathering fish and, and probably fruits from, from these plants right next to the fish pond. It's the same as what we'd see at Mensa Baca in central Mexico. And Corwa, you see the same. We all know of the extensive water scape modifications at Angkor Wat. Uh, we know the religious importance of these tanks and the importance of them for agriculture. Well, also in aquaculture. Look at the archaeology. Look at the importance of fish in the diet at Angkor Wat. Look in the friezes, in the sculpture at Angkor Wat, and the importance of like of elites and deities, like we've seen in Mesoamerica, interacting with people uh, to bring agriculture and fish to, um, to the populace at Angkor Wat. Uh, I've even looked at the archaeology of like Kaikokia in Illinois, uh, where you have extensive uh, ponds. And I've seen more like talk of reservoirs and ponds and oxbow lakes than canals, but certainly we can look for these modifications here. And fish was very important in the diet of people at Cahokia but usually hear about, about corn agriculture. So just kind of look around the world, look in the areas where you're interested in. If you see these waterscape features, these modifications, it's not just for irrigation agriculture, it's also for ecological aquaculture. And as we see in, in Africa, the modifications of the floodplain of putting in dams, just put dams along near these uh, oxbow lakes. And when the river floods, then the water is retained behind the dams and you got nat natural or ecological fish ponds. They also do another one of these kinds of extensive monumental modification of the waterscape where they stake in these areas and then put in brush and actually plant plants and have like these floating gardens uh, that attract fish. So yes, they're planting here and they are using the lake to uh, to acquire agricultural resources, but the aquatic resources in this case are actually more, more important. All the fish that is attracted to these plants and to the invertebrates and insects associated with these plants uh, is very, very important. And people can just come in and catch the, capture the fish in these, uh, in these features. We even see these extensive features back in Mexico where we have uh, extensive fish weirs and uh, floating gardens and the like. Uh, that are um, created in these rivers that would be hard to find uh, archaeologically. So it's not just canals and fish ponds, but they're actually modifying the waterscape or the watershed itself with these kind of perishable uh, remains, which we'll see perishable materials, which we leave no remains, and we'll see even these in these historic documents like John White's visits among Calusa and others along the coast of of the United States uh, and then recording these extensive kind of uh, uh, ephemeral uh, and perishable kind of aquatic features uh, in, in the landscape. And I was just recently near Mensa Baca, visited Lake Katasahan. I saw that the whole lake was staked off. So we have a, a lake that's about five miles wide by five miles wide, the whole lake. The whole lake has stakes with nets periodically put in between the stakes where people then extract fish uh, on a daily basis. So th there's very interesting different kind of modifications. All right, to, to, to then finalize, I wanna talk about what I'm thinking about research-wise uh, in these ecological aquaculture features that are very important for learning about subsistence around the world. But the interesting thing then is who who created these different kinds of features and why? Are elites creating them like we see here in Hawaii where the whole uh, waterscape, watershed is modified from the upland areas with canals and fish ponds and taro ponds, taro ponds all the way down to the coast where you actually get fish ponds then in the ocean. These were in ancient Hawaii were basically managed by elites. So are elites in Mesoamerica or in different parts of the world creating these wetland production areas or is it commoner people? 
There's a commoner use of, in, in this case here, Hawaii, the, the chiefs manage the labor and the resources to create these systems, but then they let commoners utilize them. And the commoners then would pay what they were reaping from these, uh, what they were uh, sowing from these areas and then giving them to, uh, then to elites. In the Maya area, we have elites that claim to be in charge of these kind of aquatic systems. That's again, why this rain god Chalk is walking in a canal with a basket and scooping up these cichlids or mojarras and putting them in the creel or the basket on his back. Uh, elites are claiming essentially to be kind of working to uh, bring aquatic resources to people. And even today, you can go to the area around you know, Itzapa or go to the floodplain areas in the area where I do research and still see these baskets used by people today to scoop up fish and to scoop up crustaceans in, in the water. Uh, Maya, so Maya people too, Maya elites are always have these fish uh, biting in water lilies uh, that are found in shallow water. So these irrigation canals and ponds are full of water lilies across the Maya area. And so the elites are showing with the fish in the water lily headdresses that they are essentially the ones who are bringing this to the people. They are in charge, right? They're the ones that are creating this important resource for people. Here, even the maize god. So we have a mountain here. Here's a split mountain like we have at Mensabak or we saw at Tituakan with water streaming out of this mountain. And the maize god is actually coming out of the water streams. Uh, and we see it's the maize god, and the maize god, in this case, even has cacao plants uh, coming out of his body. Uh, so we have agriculture and terrestrial resources, but then that's why fish are shown on the side of this god in this mountain, because it's agriculture, and aquatic resources that are important at that, and that Maya elites are in charge of, so to speak, if you can in interpret it this way. However, at the same time, when you look at the graphically or historically, then it's usually communal labor drives that are making canals or going and gathering uh, these uh, aquatic resources. And so we have this kind of more collective common pool resources and collective or community organization that is in charge of the domesticated waterscape and not elites. Uh, we see that with the raised field and canal systems in central Mexico and so Chimilco and other areas where it's families and communities that are creating and maintaining these domesticated waterscapes and elites are just taxing people. They just tax or they reap the benefits of these, but they don't care about how people are organizing the labor to create these canals and, and these waterscapes. And so we even have today in, uh, I'm working with a community in Tabasco that has uh, extensive raised field canal systems. They even get manatees that come in this, in this waterscape here, but it's, it's, it's community owned and driven. It's not even, uh, it, it, there's no elite concerns or government concerns with how people uh, run this system. So that's kind of what I'm interested in archaeologically and, and looking to uh, then in my grant proposals, for instance, and looking at how if elites or commoners are, 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 are organizing the labor for creating these systems and then reaping the benefits of, of them. It, who is, elites or commoners? It's an interesting question that, uh, that we can't answer for around the world at this time. Another thing is archaeologically. So why is a lot of this being missed? Well, if you don't do fine screening or wet screening, you're not going to get the very small fish jaw bones or vertebra or other remains. And so we're starting to do this uh, in Amazonia and in wetland canals and ponds where you do have uh, extensive ecological aquaculture archaeologists are finding the evidence uh, of these fish. And even at Palenque, a site near where I'm doing research, there was an archaeologist for his dissertation that started wet screening all of the excavated dirt from the ancient Maya site in Palenque and found tons of fish. And again, the, the, the species are similar, catfish, cichlids, and other fish that do very well in canals and fish ponds. Uh, so it's just interesting results. We have to do more fine screening in order to find evidence for the at least the fish. 
Not so much the turtles and the ducks, but at least the fish. And then also I'm looking at the applications of this. So when I fly in and then out of, of, of uh, Phoenix, the Phoenix area, I'm just always amazed at all the canals and reservoirs, but, but no aquaculture. There's no plants growing along these. And there's a lot of carp in the system, uh, but kind of culturally people in Arizona don't eat carp. Uh, but there's still a lot of very, very important kind of the, the application potential for this project is, is, is big uh, as well, where you get people living right alongside these aquatic features. And, and, and you often see uh, people still talking about the uh, irrigation agriculture when in Mesoamerica and some of the earliest societies in Mesoamerica, they're finding these canals and reservoirs. They talk about irrigation of the agricultural system or pot irrigation. And I'm wondering now, even the origins of irrigation canals and raised fields, if they aren't by fishers in the archaic period. So we're talking maybe five, 6,000 years ago, that was fisher people that first started making canals. And you're asking, well, why? Why would they do that? Well, like I said, it's easier to cut, uh, it, you expand your resource base if you make canals for one, fish enter these canals. And so you, the fish populations rise, then you can block them off and you can fish out of them. So you can easily capture the resources that you've been capturing for thousands of years anyway. There are fishers before there were farmers. Uh, the earliest canals and then in Mesoamerica anyway, again, even in the old world, you think Tigris and Euphrates uh, are before the farmers. So, and then, uh, then there's not only irrigation, but then slash and burn agriculture. Well, fishers slash and burn the, the plants growing along the canals because they fertilize the system with the carbon. Plus they can access the canals if they then fire all these thorny plants and get them out of the way and then grow what they want to grow. I actually think irrigation agriculture and slash and burn agriculture was developed by fishers who were interested in, in expanding their subsistence spreadsheet and not just focusing on agriculture, but first focusing on the aquatic resources and then going to the agricultural ones. And I, I wanna test that at Mensabach too, because if I can date the canals or much earlier than the site that, that they were living at later, then that shows that it was fishers who were focusing on aquatic resources before agricultural. So um, off on another interesting kind of tangent on this, this research. So to, to finalize here then, I just wanted to leave you with this idea then in, in this talk that domesticated waterscapes are really important in ecological aquaculture and uh, wetland production is very, very important. And it's not just agriculture, which is a Western perspective and from a Western educational system. It's not from an indigenous education. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, let's, um, let me, I'm sure that we have some questions here because I'm seeing them pop up and I think it might be best if we simply, if people raise their hands and I'll, I'll go down through and um, and ask you to unmute. But really quickly, let me ask you one question, Joel. You can hear me, right? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, a lot of people don't realize that for, I actually went to Mensabach a few years ago and um, there were little land crabs there. Like, well, you know, and so some people ma imagine crabs in the ocean, but could you tell, talk a little bit about the resources such as crabs and and maybe the the piguas and things like that, that, that people could have been using? Sure, yeah, they love crabs at Mensabach and they're freshwater and they do very well. Uh, they do very well in, uh, in these canals because the crabs just need access to a little bit of water. Um, and so they, and so the lock and don't go to the canals that are still extant around the area and capture the crabs. They also capture the, um, the, I'm thinking in Lac Andone now, for just when you mentioned Lindsay by going with them to catch crabs, what do they call the hutes, the, 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 the tunu, the hute shells, that you can actually farm those too. If you get the water moving enough, you can then actually have these hute mollusk 
uh, farms where you can then extract tons of these mollusks. And get, guess what is the most common artifact at any period in Mensabak? It's the Ute shell. There are tons, even compared to ceramic sherds, we have more Ute shells than, than ceramic sherds. So they're, they're farming them. I don't quite understand how they're doing it yet, uh, but that's part of, the, of, of, of this new research project that I'm kind of just starting now too. But you're right, um, they're, they're, they're accessing all kinds of different aquatic uh, species. Thank you. I, all the hands went down, and but I did see that Agnieszka Haman had a hand up. Can you unmute? Okay. Uh, hi, I was just clapping. That wasn't raising my hand. Okay. Did, did, did anyone have questions? I guess there's some in the... Um, okay, so uh, there are some in the chat box. Um, so... Um, Paula ask, um, what happens now with the preservation of these archaeological and natural resources? Hmm. Well, uh, so for some like the artifacts and that, uh, they're, they're preserved. We have them in the lab or we have some in uh, the museum in Chiapas and and they'll eventually be archived in, uh, in a museum in probably Mexico City or Tusa Gutierrez in Chiapas. Uh, other features, so yeah, the wetlands is hard to dig. You find things like post holes or posts, and they're kind of hard to, to preserve. Um, so yeah, I mean, that is an issue with the, the wetland features, and then plus they don't last long either, even like lock and dome posts or weirs only lasts for one season. So it's kind of hard to preserve these without document, documenting them photographically or in video. Uh, is, that, is that kind of what you're asking or are you asking uh, something related um, to that? I was thinking in a, in a broader sense. I mean, this is, it's a, also a living landscape. It's a landscape being used by descendants who are still there. Yeah. And you have climate change issues, you have expansion of um town cities tourism yeah into yeah. those areas so i was wondering what if anything was part of the research project to think about how that gets um preserved for the people who are still practicing yeah some yeah, that's that's a great question and a great comment it's and it is a big concern, right? Because even like in Phoenix, I'm thinking, wow, let's apply this to Phoenix. But what if there's no water? <laughs> there, there will be, of course, but it will be reduced in 20 years. But but it, but the waterscape is going to change. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. But the interesting thing is, is I see some are drying up, of course, right? Because there are raised fields in Belize that are now on dry land, but I'm seeing at the same time that the deep lagoons of Tabasco are becoming now great fishing grounds because they're getting shallower. Uh, whenever you have shallower water, it allows sunlight to go through the shallower water and you can grow more water lilies and you can grow more grasses, so to speak, uh, underwater. And it's those plants in the system that that really provide the insects and the invertebrates for the fish. So now I see, yes, some are drying up, but but other waterscape features are expanding because of climate change. Uh, in the case of many of these, though, you need water that is moving uh, and uh, a river, or you need rainwater moving at certain times of the year. Um, and so I still see this where we think it's drying up, even like in the Phoenix area, we're still seeing uh, uh, plenty of water. And in fact, I'm not in Phoenix now, but I know it's raining there just in the last few days, which is really weird. But, um, but anyway, I'm seeing that there are changes and it is worrisome, but for right now, uh, in the case of Mensa Bach, I don't see much modification of, of the system. What's really interesting is it's still functional after 2,000 years. And you know, ask yourself, will, will a plastic pool and a cement pool aquaculture system that is now favored by a lot of people, will these 
endure 2,000 years? I doubt it. And in fact, the answer is no, right? They will not endure 2,000 years. But what people did over the last few thousand years at Metzabach and other areas on a massive scale, they essentially uh, replicated ponds and canals and oxbow lakes within the floodplain area. And it still exists because it, it mimics the natural world. It doesn't it's not an artificial kind of in, uh, emplacement in the natural world, like a cement or a plastic fish pond is. And then when the water moves through the system, it actually clears out a lot of the uh, sediment. So think of like a fish pond and a canal being full of water. As soon as the water level goes down in the dry season, the water moves quickly and it actually cleans the system out. For the next year, when the rains and the water rises, it brings in sediments and then fills in again. So it, it's a, it's a self-contained system. It's actually, it's brilliant, uh, but it's massive. And so we could do it like Phoenix, since it's full of canals, most of them are along indigenous canals, by the way, but, the, but you could create these systems in any city around the world today by having a massive kind of labor and infrastructure and resources devoted to creating ecological aquaculture that would last 2000 years but get any politician or anybody with any resources to sign up for the job, probably in our culture, at least wouldn't work. Maybe, maybe it would, I, I don't know. But so it's fascinating that yes, it's, it is concerning that, that when the waterscape changes that, that these kind of aquatic systems will change, but at the same time, they're pretty resilient. Um, so Leah Kalinkos asks, how likely is it that the religious worship of plants, of, I'm sorry, parts of nature like water and fish aided in the in predisposing Maya people to in, enabling these symbiotic and effective practices or are conducive to this sub, sort of subsistence? It, it's very important. That's the whole cultural aspect of getting of getting people integrated into this kind of in integrated system, uh, subsistence system. So if, uh, yeah, if like religiously tarp would become important in the United States, religiously and culturally, you could get people interested in if it's an important religious food, uh, which did work in the past, by the way, right? Think of fish on Friday. Uh, that's how fish in the Western world got to be so important because of, of religion, especially the expansion of Catholicism. Uh, so different kinds of fish, including then carp, would be consumed more if they were kind of religious substrates to the whole thing. And that's why if you think, I, I know of Mesoamerican iconography better than I do Angkor Wat and in Mesopotamia. However, there, to, to have elite people putting fish ponds and canals in elite art means that there are religious reasons for making these subsistence systems important. In, in the case of the Maya, the, you, I already mentioned the, the fish, the mojarras biting on the water lilies. You need that kind of system in order to get a lot of mojarras. But some of the most important animals in Maya iconography, and I'm even thinking now Asian, are like turtles. Right? Like ponds and, and mountains within ponds are seen as turtles. And turtles are actually... I, I didn't talk about them today because I, I don't have a lot of time to talk about all of the important resources from aquaculture, but turtles are a main one. Uh, I, I didn't talk about the storage efficiency of this system. If you have a lot of canals and fish ponds, it's like a supermarket, isn't it? You can go wade in the water and grab a fish and grab a turtle. So, um, but turtles are really important in my iconography and it shows the importance of turtles as part of the ancient Maya and Mesoamerican subsistence system. So I, 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 that's a great point. And for me, it can't just be thinking about eating and you have to think about culture and religion and the economy. Uh, for indigenous societies, if all of these come together, you can't separate them like in Western society. Even ask Lac Andone, what's the most important thing do you have to do before you go make a field or before you go fishing? And they'll say, you got to pay the gods for it. You have to give an offering. Right there, that shows that religion is integrated into the economy. 
Uh, so I, I think your point is an excellent one. Do we have time for a couple more questions or? Joel, uh, I'm fine. I'm okay, fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Jeffrey Vaudrin asks, um, wait, let's see. I think part of it's cut off. How much Maya technology was developed in Mexico and how much was brought ancestry from Asia? Yeah, another, yeah, because it's so similar to um, uh, aquaculture systems around the world. Um, I, I think by going by the archaeological record that it was people in archaic times in Mesoamerica that developed canals in aquaculture and then agriculture irrigation agriculture and slash and burn milpa. So it was probably before any kind of contact with the outside world. The interesting thing is that a lot of people in the new world are from Asia, uh, where perhaps people have been experimenting with canals and aquaculture and then agriculture for thousands of years. But I, I don't know the, um, the time depth on Asian aquaculture systems. And of course, people have continuously been coming from the old world into the new world. But um, I would say right now, from what I know from the archeology, span that it looks like it's indigenous uh, uh, waterscape features that are similar to what we would see in Asia and in Mesopotamia and in Africa. And again, it's like, well, how do you mod modify a floodplain? The best way to do it is to canalize the floodplain and then have the canals lead to fish ponds. What is the best way to modify a lake? Uh, put in floating gardens and stakes and then maybe some raised fields. Uh, we get the same kind of technology or, around the world because I think people solve problems in the same way kind of autonomously. Um, so that's all I can answer your question now, but it, I, I would say in most parts of the world it's indigenous wherever you've seen these kind of systems. Yeah, of course, there's different ones, right? Think of the rice paddies. So again, the Western perspective is, oh, let's look at rice paddies. Let's do the archaeology of the origins of rice. And then they ignore all the carp bones that are in, in the fish ponds and in the archaeological record. Uh, so the two, carp fishing and farming, arose at the same time as rice paddy uh, uh, agriculture. But that is something very distinctive to uh, Asia because of the waterscapes and then rice farming is very different than, than farming in the New World with corn and, and fruit trees and beans and squash and sunflowers. So you need different kinds of systems for different kinds of plants and, and, and then aquatic animals. So it's indigenous is, is, is the answer, is the short answer. And then you got my long answer already. Sheldon Skaggs asks, in Codex uh, Vaticanus um, Canal, are those shellfish as well as fish? Yeah, there's a lot of mollusks in the system. I talked about the, uh, let's see, so there's different mollusks that would be, uh, would expand. The interesting thing is that I even think that people were introducing other species into these waterscape system. So let me go back to your, to your question first is you have different mollusks. So think like clams, water snails, and then the hute, the spirally kind of pointed shell water snail. It, it, just many of us know from walking around in parks and fishing that there's all kinds of mollusks in, in these waters as well, as are crustaceans. And I'm thinking me as an Illinois boy, uh, going fishing, I always saw the big clams in the water and even crayfish uh, and turtles, right? We saw all these things in the water. So mollusks are a big part of it. But the introduction of these two is interesting. At Mensabaca, they're introducing the the tortuga blanca or the white turtle, which is in the Usumacinta River. Uh, they're introducing larger cichlids. I think they're taking pots uh, ceramic vessels, putting them on their backs, putting some water in, getting some of these species and coming in and dumping them into the Mensabach system. And then I had a colleague remind me who has a lot more biology under his belt than I do. And he looked at me and says, fish could bring them in. I'm like, what? Yeah, they bring the eggs in on their feathers or they grab some of these mollusks or, or fish and then fly from the river, which is about 
30 kilometers away, about 20 miles away, coming in and then dropping them in the lake. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. So, um, but species are being introduced into these system, including some mollusks could be introduced in the system, but I have to sort that out. I, I hope that addresses your question. Okay, one last question then. Okay, if this is from James Bacon. If there's no elevation data for finding in LIDAR due to sediment fill, would it be possible to use remote sensing and geophysics techniques and so on to try and identify possible features for excavation um, I work at YSI, some with probable but untested, unexcavated wetland canals and and one where no uh, current visible evidence is on the surface. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you can if you could pull a, a ground-penetrating uh, radar machine, a GPR, if, if it's open enough where you can pull the cart and uh, you can find it. Uh, the best way to do is to do test excavations or long trenches, and then you can see the canals uh, and the raised fields in your profile. Um, but you know the best analysis, so the, the person that I'm working with is a sediments expert, and, and just by coring, coring around, if you get a sediments and a soil expert, by, by doing systematic coring, you can see where there used to be sediments and where there used to be dry land as well. Uh, so there are many ways uh, to do it. I would suggest first just do some random trenching or get somebody to do some dry coring, uh, systematic dry coring, and then you can, and then you can find it, find those features. Um, well, actually, there's one additional question. If you can do it, <laughs> it's a Osley Era mask. Um, I really liked how you mentioned the use of baskets for scooping up aquatics. Are there any other tools for catching aquatics by the ancestral Maya? Um, also, are they depicted on mythological artwork? Yeah, that's that's neat too, because you do, I, I am really kind of getting educated on the different fishing techniques, because you need to know that in order to interpret the features you're finding. And Oh, there are so many different kinds of nets and snares. Like I need, didn't even know about like fish snares before where you have a stick with a loop on a string and you just put that around the fish and then you pull on it and you and you nab the fish. My other favorite one is I always laughed at, remember that program on, I think it was on TV, the Discovery Channel about the guys in Louisiana that were fishing with their hands? <laughs> That's actually the most common kind of way of catching fish. And we saw that in my art with them just grabbing fish in the water because fish, they, 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 they sleep under rocks or they'll sleep in pools and you can sneak up on them and, and grab them. Another technique is, uh, is just throwing rocks in the water. The percussion can stun the fish and, and they'll, you can grab them. Uh, the other is fish poisons. Uh, it's actually the, the best kind of technique is uh, you, you put in, uh, in the Lacandon area, the Lacandon use a vine that coats the gills of the fish and it just half suffocates them or suffocates the fish. And so it, it's not dangerous to people to ingest this vine, but it's dangerous for the fish. So the fish just kind of float and then people uh, grab them. I, I've seen people fish with buckets, with window screen, with baskets. Uh, there, there's just numerous ways to fish inside these canals and fish ponds and, it, and, it, and it's fascinating in itself and 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 I do need to research it uh, more. So it's gone well beyond just just hook and line and uh, netting. In fact, people are so good with like the bow and arrow in the Lock and Down area that they used to just fish at any time of the year with a bow and arrow. If a fish comes up to get some food or just is hanging on the top of the water, they'd shoot an arrow through it. Sometimes the fish would be the size of my hand. That's how good shots they were. Um, and they would take fish with, with just the bow and arrow. So there's tons of different kinds of technologies to use that people use in fishing. And that's why it's, I think it's so important that people, we have to look at the origins of fishing and canals, making canals, because I think they're making these canals and fish ponds. It's with certain technology that's going with it in order to for them to extract more of the resources that they're used to extracting again there were people taking fish and turtles all around the world before they were growing crops and i think they started burning and and modifying the landscape around their canals and then just and then started experimenting with plants 
But to look at the, all the technology involved in this, it's, it's fascinating. Well, thank you very much, Joel. That was an excellent lecture, and I, I think everybody enjoyed it. And um, um, everybody have a great evening, and thank you for coming. And um, there will be another one next month. So thank you, Joel Powell. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the invitation to speak to you all. And uh, if anybody has any other questions, just um, send a note or to, to my ASU, uh, Arizona State University, email address, and I'll, and I'll uh, gladly respond. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to send you an email, by the way. All, all right. right. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, we'll, uh, okay. we'll be in touch. Yeah, okay. I'll see you soon. All right. See you. Bye, everyone. Bye.